Um, I'm joined on stage today by three members of the editorial board of HD News website, HD Buzz, Dr. Rachel Harding from the Structural Genomics Consortium at the University of Toronto, Dr. Sarah, yes, definitely, go for it. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Hernandez from UC Irvine, and Professor Ed Wild from the University College London Huntington's Disease Research Center. And managing our Q&A today will be Dr. Leora Fox from HDSA. The team of writers and editors you see on stage represent HD clinicians, scientists, and family members with experience discussing HD science in plain language, and today they will tackle your questions about HD research in real time. Um, if you've been here before, you know how this works, but if not, if you're new here like me, um, there's no slideshow, there's no presentation associated with this. You guys are in the driver's seat, so go ahead and ask your questions as they come up. Um, in your convention app, you can go ahead and click on, the, or click on this sec session in your agenda, and there should be a Q&A tab at the top. That's where you can go ahead and put your questions in. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Leora to get started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi again to many of you who are at our research sessions here. Um, and now this has been closed. Okay, we've already got some questions coming in. Um, and yeah, this is gonna be my role is just sort of posing the questions. And uh, usually, you know, when HD Buzz is answering questions, we're kind of in, in the, the back of the room sort of thinking about it together. But these are really gonna be on the spot for <laughs> my colleagues here. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to focus today where there's, I'm sure there will be many, many questions from people here and people at home. Um, I'm going to focus on ones that are um, sort of lean less towards the personal and more towards the science. If you have specific medical questions, um, we're probably going to either save those or suggest that you uh, speak with a, a, a medical professional. Um, uh, even though the lovely Ed Wild is a medical professional. <laughs> um, but I'm, I, I have seen a, a few questions here about uh, CRISPR. And so really I, I think this comes down to um, the idea of CRISPR being a, a DNA editing uh, method. Uh, why can't we use CRISPR in people to just chop out the HD gene? And how close are we to doing clinical trials of CRISPR? Hey everyone. I am a doctor, but you I'm can, you not... Can, speakers, you, you can remove your masks oh, okay. if you would like. Hi. <laughs> uh, not licensed to practice in the United States of America or anywhere outside the UK. So um, Rachel to my right will now remind everyone what CRISPR stands for. <laughs> you should know. You should have heard me do that to Jeff. Sarah? Clustered. Repeat. Insect? Interdispersed? Short, poly, <laughs> it's not crisser, poly, repeat. CRISPR is a very helpful device for keeping your lettuces fresh at the bottom of your refrigerator <laughs> and other very old dad jokes. Okay, CRISPR is a, um, it's a naturally occurring system that bacteria use to defend themselves. It's like an immune system that bacteria have, and it basically involves bacteria being able to slice up DNA, if it's DNA that shouldn't be there, but it also has a, like, a ways of joining DNA together. And I'm gonna, Amber's face here in the front row is my barometer of uh, how, whether I'm talking nonsense. <coughs> so this was discovered quite recently, and at the time it was hailed as a kind of like, wow, this is so cool, but it, if we could, if we could borrow the, these machines that bacteria are using to cut DNA and and stitch it back together, we could we could do all sorts of things in humans, and um, that still I think is the um, dream, and that's like the intention of people using CRISPR in the context of Huntington's disease. But it's really complicated. So those of you who are in the research session this morning will have heard us talk about the Unicure gene therapy trial, right? So this is the idea that you take a, a friendly virus, you scoop out the contents, you put custom DNA into it, and then you infect the brain, and the brain then becomes a factory for making whatever you have, um, whatever instructions you've put into the virus. 
And because CRISPR is a set of machines that are made from proteins, that's how we would have to deliver CRISPR to the brain if we were going to do it. In other words, you can't just take these machines and put them into the brain. The only thing you can send into the brain is a set of written instructions for making the CRISPR machines, so the DNA snipping and uh, stitching um, uh, equipment. You have to put the instructions in the brain in the form of a virus, and then um, the virus will turn the cells into a factory for making the machines that cuts the DNA and repairs the DNA. That's essentially what would have to happen. And so then, like, I think the best way to treat Huntington's disease is to go into every cell in the brain, or indeed every cell in the body, find the expanded CAG repeat, snip out some of the CAGs, turn, and then stitch the ends together so you turn it into a normal length CA, an unexpanded CAG repeat. And then you've got two healthy copies of the Huntington gene. But that's, inc that's actually an incredibly difficult thing to do, especially with CRISPR. Um, there are, let me say this, there are general challenges for the use of CRISPR in humans and in brains, and then there are specific challenges in Huntington's disease. Rachel, what are the, <laughs> what are the general, general challenges of that approach that I've just set out? in uh, humans? Well, I think you've covered the key one, which is being able to get this CRISPR machinery to where we need it to be. And that's going to be really challenging. And that even if we use some kind of virus to deliver the machinery where we think it needs to go, actually making sure it does go to every single cell in the brain, for example, is going to be very challenging, for sure. Um, the other problem with CRISPR is that in principle, it is very specific. And so basically what you can do is you can design special pieces of DNA that kind of make part of the machinery to tell it to go to exactly this part of the genetic code and make these exact changes. But there's increasingly evidence that there's some kind of off-target effects. And before we start editing people's genomes, we really need to be sure that we know exactly what's going on and that we're not going to introduce like other problems by using machinery that's you know a little bit dodgy around the edges. What sort of problems could you cause if you accidentally hit the wrong gene? So you could introduce mutations elsewhere in the genome, which could switch on or switch off other genes. That means that you're not expressing those genes at the right level, for example. Um, or, you know, so much of the genome, we don't actually really even understand what it does. But we know it's really important to maintain a lot of these different parts of the genome. So there could be completely unknown consequences or consequences where you, you wouldn't realize for a generation or two. Um, yeah, so it's quite tricky. And... Um that why don't I mean just try it and if it goes wrong just switch it off. <laughs> yeah, so these are irreversible changes. Oh. <laughs> Goodness gracious! I don't think I've ever done one of these sessions with Ed in person before. <laughs> it's, uh, very, it's not the same as a Zoom call. <laughs> it's not the same as a Zoom call. <laughs> very Socratic. But yeah, absolutely. So all the changes. Um, introduced through CRISPR, particularly if they end up in the eggs and the sperm, then those are th changes that are going to be passed on from one generation to the next. So we have to be really careful that everything that we're doing is done in an ethical way and in a way that we understand what's happening. So you probably read about in the news, like a few years ago, there was a scientist in China who did a completely unauthorized CRISPR experiment in a, um, two children. And basically, he was massively condemned from pretty much every corner of the scientific universe to say, like, this is an unethical thing to do. You don't know how well this has worked. You don't know what the consequences are yet. And so whilst it's a really promising technology, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to show that we're going to get the results that we want and not introduce some sort of cataclysmic issues into people's genomes, um, which they would be stuck with forever. Sarah. Uh there, is there anything particular about Huntington's that makes it e an even more difficult target for CRISPR as a therapeutic? Um, well, I mean, along with Huntington, like, we don't truly know what will happen if we knock down Huntington long-term in people. That's something that we don't have data on. And so, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also hard to control the level to which you're knocking down something with CRISPR. Right. So basically, I, as I understand it, because each cell has just two copies of that DNA, you either change one or you change both. And that those are your options, but in a in a like an area a, uh, an area of the brain that's the size of my little fingernail, there might be fifty million neurons, and some of them will have no CRISPR 
changes, and some of them might be completely switched off. So it's a bit like, so what does that mean for my little finger? Especially if, the, if it's made of little grains of sand that are all different from each other. Right. So, I mean, so we know in Huntington's research that we have kind of this Goldilocks zone that we want to reduce expression of Huntington's. Um, and if we can get it to there in mice, we have very conclusive data. There are very positive effects. But when we go too far, if we start reducing Huntington to 60, 80, 90 percent, um, there are really catastrophic effects because this is an essential protein. It's critical for the body. And so when we start playing with systems that we don't yet have the technology to control, that's when it can get a little, a little dicey. And if we go too far too fast with a system that we can't control, we're only going to be setting ourselves back in the long run because we're going to be running trials that could do damage. It's going to damage um, people that want to participate in trials that might have a similar mechanism of action in the future. Um, and we could be spending that energy trying to understand the system better before we try to commit people into these trials. So CRISPR. It's a basically a non-starter, and we should stop thinking about it. Am I right, right ladies? <laughs> right now, right now. I think we will get there in the future, but today um, it's a super fascinating, very powerful tool. Tool. What do you mean by tool? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I mean something that we can use to study Huntington's at the moment, um, but it's not ready for a therapeutic interface with patients. And do you, uh, do you have any sense of how CRISPR might be useful right now to study Huntington's disease? What sort of things? Well, there's an experiment going on in the lab in which I work where we're modulating expression of certain proteins in stem cells using CRISPR. Um, and so what we can do is in cells um, that won't go into people that we can very much control and we're not going to damage or ruin anyone's lives is try to understand how modulating expression of certain proteins is contributing to Huntington's disease. Um, and this is a very, you know, artificial system, it's a model system, if you guys were in our previous session, uh, that will help us gain answers about Huntington's disease, but we're not bringing that into clinical trials. So, uh, and the, the lab, I'm not really a lab person, but the lab people I speak to, basically the, if they want to see what happens when you switch on or off one particular gene, it used to be like, oh, this is gonna take us ages and we have to like fire a DNA gun at the cells and stuff and it's very low effectiveness. With CRISPR, you can basically, there are, you can basically take your cells or your mouse uh, ovaries or whatever and send them to, you, all have, you guys all have mouse ovaries, right? Uh, <laughs> send them to a CRISPR company and say, we want this gene turned off and we want this gene turned on and if we feed the mice uh, waffles, this gene needs to turn off. And then they go, okay, CRISPR, 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 and then they send it back. <laughs> it's not actually much more complicated than that as I understand it. And, um, <laughs> and so basically stuff that used to take like two and a half years is now taking much less, six months, I don't know, less. So it's dramatically accelerating the progress of, of research, bi biological research across the board, and in HD particularly. And it's not that, it, it's, not that it's never gonna be a therapeutic, I'm pretty sure it is, or something like it will be, like we'll be doing targeted genome editing or targeted interventions to uh, reduce the harm of the Huntington expansion at the DNA level. Um, the, the question is whether it's CRISPR that we go in with or whether we invent, we start with CRISPR and invent a thing that's even better than CRISPR that can get into the brain, that can be switched off and onable. Of course. Ladies and gentlemen, Amber Southwell. Sorry, I'm making a habit of this. Um, I think one of the things that um, people need to understand when thinking about CRISPR is the reason it's such a good tool for working with cells is you have these cells growing in a dish and you can add your CRISPR and then you can separate out the cells and grow up many, many copies of each of those cells and then you can sequence the genome of them and identify the cells that got exactly the change you wanted and no other changes and then you use that further in your research. But you can't do that kind of selection for what was edited the way that you wanted it to be edited if you're talking about a living brain. I'm going to do something that I rarely do, which is cut off a question, <laughs> because there are so very yeah, many great ahead. ones, um, and those were all great Do we want to take a follow-up? Well. So um, you moderate. We're, we're doing all of these through the app, okay. so if you could oh. please submit your questions. <laughs> um, so... The next question that of the many that are here is, um, uh, and I've lost it now. Okay, 
Have there, have I'm, there I'm been, Leora's my boss. Have there been any environmental effects on the progression of HD? Have there been environmental effects on the, on the progression of HD? This is a really difficult one because the answer is kind of definitely yes. Um, but we don't know what they are, or it's very difficult to prove what they are. And what, like, envir environmental effects, we don't mean like global warming and stuff. We mean um, stuff that's not genetic. So we now know from big studies like Enroll HD that there are genetic modifiers of HD. So there are genetic differences between people which have an effect on the age of onset or the rate of progression of HD. Um, and, but that, even after we account for all of that genetic stuff, there's still differences between people that go beyond the length of the CAG repeat. And we think that that stuff is probably environment, so a non-genetic modifiers. And it could be anything. Like the obvious things to think about are, you know, smoking, other medications that you take, uh, what food you eat, what, uh, how much alcohol you drink, do you, uh, what uh, illegal drugs you take. I mean, the thing is, like, we, everyone in this room knows ways to accelerate the progression of Huntington's disease, right? <laughs> uh, get up really early in the morning, have a challenging day of flights ahead of you, um, get your, uh, get your, uh, your taxi is late, uh, you know, you uh, have had uh, too much caffeine or not enough caffeine, right? That all of those make Huntington's disease worse. The question is whether, whether we can prove that uh, any of these particular things is accelerating the progression of HD. And there are some obvious things like in every other disease, things that are really bad, like smoking basically across the board, uh, with uh, some debatable exceptions, but across the board smoking is bad for brain diseases. Being a professional boxer, or even worse, an amateur boxer. <laughs> <laughs> Being a really bad boxer is bad for the brain, and that kind of makes sense. Um, so you can, and those are things that we probably like, we don't necessarily need to prove that hitting your head against a brick wall is bad for HD, but, the reason this stuff is so difficult to prove is because, um, preview, uh, you know what, why is it so difficult to prove? <laughs> well, I would say a variety of reasons, like, um, but this is the sort of stuff that Enroll HD, for example, is trying to look at, is tracking p patients and control groups over a long period of time, collecting a ton of data about the people who are involved in these kind of large-scale observational studies. But with a rare disease like Huntington's, it's still really difficult to prove because you just need that statistical power and you need that number of people. Also, you can't make a design an experiment where you're like, okay, here are 500 people. I want you all to smoke. And I don't want any of the 500 people over there to smoke because it's extremely unethical. So that's kind of another challenge. So you just have to deal with the, the populations that you have access to. So I, I think that's absolutely right. And it's, it's not just the number of people, but also the, the length of time it would take to yeah. prove that. Like, you could, you could take 10,000 people in the Enroll HD study and say, like, well, okay, what, are, what about people who take aspirin every day? Does that protect the brain against Huntington's disease? It's, there's every chance it might. I don't know. But 5,000 of them are taking it. 5,000 of them aren't. But maybe you have to study them for 30 years for, that, for the effect of that intervention to take effect. And so, I mean, we haven't got 30 years, right? <laughs> so we, is, there a, is there a different way to do it? So the other thing you can do is you can get a thousand people now and say you've all got Huntington's disease how old were you when you got it and then you look you, you compare that with the predicted age of onset from the CAG repeat and then you look back through the history or you say to them did you smoke did you drink did you take aspirin and and that's been used in the past to try and and help to sort of have a pop at some of these questions but unfortunately it's really unreliable because it's really um affected by recall bias so if you like, and, and the pe people with Huntington's disease don't necessarily have the best recall of, like, whether they smoked, uh, you know, how many cigarettes they smoked in their 20s or whatever, or they might want to give an answer that's helpful or whatever. So there's a variety of reasons why that kind of looking back or retrospective research can produce sometimes quite misleading answers. We did a thing that was very cool uh, with the RAND uh, Institute, RAND Corporation, which is a statistical corporation um, a couple of years ago, which is w that we, instead of sort of just, just taking these differences between re like questionnaire answers and looking at one group and another group, we used the massive Enroll HD database to run a sort of simulated clinical trial in which we, um, we divided people into two groups and look uh, from like 10 years ago and then we balance the groups on the basis of all sorts of characteristics like age and CAG repeat and other um, other factors so we ended up with this sort of um, 
clinical trial that happened inside a computer. And then you basically let, let those two groups run through time and then find out what their rates of progression in Huntington's disease were. And the main finding from that study was that all of the little things that had been reported previously as being potential environmental modifiers turned out not to be statistically robust, which is uh, kind of good in a way because the last thing we want is people choosing to do something or choosing not to do something on the basis of stuff that then later isn't, doesn't it, uh, stand the test of time. So that's the answer. And what this comes down to, and this is not medical advice, but it is very boring advice, the best advice we can give is that the things that everyone should do to protect their brain w are the same whether they have HD or not. So, you know, exercise a bit, jump up and down, eat vegetables, don't smoke, uh, do yoga, <laughs> sleep, all of that stuff. Super boring, but it's true. And basically the stuff that protects your blood vessels is the stuff that protects your brain. If you've got blood flowing to your brain, that's better than if you haven't got enough blood flowing to your brain. Too much blood flowing to the brain is not really a thing because the brain will just be like, ah, uh, uh, thanks, I don't need all that blood. <laughs> but if there isn't enough blood flowing, <laughs> It's very difficult for the brain to overcome bunged up uh, blood vessels. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your TED talk. Um, I'm going to so talk less, I promise. There's a lot of great questions here. I'm going to ask a one that is uh, repeated here and that um, I hear a lot as well, which is what are you most excited about uh, in terms of the therapies that are, that are being developed and that are out there? Um, really, the question is sometimes, uh, how, which is the, which is the most promising? Um, but that's a really tough question to answer. So, um, what are some of the things that you're excited about? Yeah, I'm not going to touch the most promising one. Um, <laughs> uh, what I'm most excited about are the small molecules. Like honestly, I was sharing this story with Rachel earlier. When I first got into HD research, I was working as a chemist because I really wanted to develop a cure for Huntington's, like a true blue drug that you would give someone and they would be cured of Huntington's. But I got, I was four years in and I jumped ship because I'm like, we're never going to have a brain penetrable small molecule that someone's going to eat and it's going to modulate Huntington's. And here we are many years later and we have two in clinical trials. Like, it seems like science fiction. Even five years ago, I don't think many scientists would have believed we would have been here. Um, but I have a lot of hope for these, these small molecule splice modulators. Um, and I'm super excited. I'm excited to see where they go, and I'm pumped about it. Maybe I should have stayed in chemistry. I don't know, but I'm here. <laughs> I, maybe it happened because you left chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasant thought. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely share Sarah's excitement about splicing modulators. I think it's the thing that everyone's really talking about, and like the fact that you can treat... You know, Huntington's is not just a brain disease, it is a systemic disease, and being able to lower Huntington across the body is something that people are really interested in studying and understanding. Um, I think the thing that really excites me is, like, for folks of you who were here for the HD 101 session earlier today, was Addis had this amazing slide of, like, all of these different companies with all of these different drugs treating, you know, symptoms, but also trying to design disease-modifying therapies, so things that would slow down or halt Huntington's or even maybe reverse it, we don't know. Like, but just the breadth of companies that are doing this kind of work, like that is what I think is really exciting. You know, for a rare disease to have all of these super talented folks working on so many different avenues of investigation, and for all of them to be, you know, generating tons and tons of data all the time, I think that's really interesting. And the thing that really excites me now is like, um, I'm a basic scientist, so as much as I try my best to understand all the clinical stuff, is the basic science that is what really excites me. And there are so many breakthroughs in other fields that we can apply those technologies to Huntington's that will hopefully help us progress our understanding of the disease biology. You know, we're in the age of AI and big data, and we can start extracting like so much more information from these big data sets that we're collecting through Enroll HD and use machine learning to try and you know, provide new insights that no one has ever really, even really thought about. Like, that's really, really cool. So there's all these new technologies which we can apply to everything that we want to do in Huntington's, and that's going to push the field forward. I, I think I, I agree with both of those answers. Like, I, I am excited about the small molecule. I think all molecules are pretty small, to be honest. <laughs> but um, anyway, I think the, small, the, splicing, the oral splicing modulators, PTC and Novartis, with actually several other companies waiting in the wings to try similar things. Um, that's 
that is cool right now, but um, you know, seven years ago, ASOs were super cool, and they still are. And and actually, we know more about ASOs than we did, and so and we think we have a better idea of how to turn those into a therapeutic that actually will make a, a difference clinically. So I guess I'm excited about the pipeline of drugs coming through and whatever happens next. And I suspect that we will, you know, I still think that we'll probably end up a little bit like something like HIV, where there was nothing, 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 another thing failed, another thing failed. And then one thing worked, at a, and it, but it only worked to change a number and then, but the drug turned out to be like toxic in other ways, and then new problems like viral resistance arose with the first generations of HIV drugs. And the big breakthrough was combination therapy in HIV, which was you, you, you take three drugs, three is the magic number, you take three drugs, each of which makes a little difference, but they all work together, and the effect is, best, is greater than the sum of their parts. We haven't got a foot in the door yet, clinically, in terms of halt, slowing the progression of Huntington's disease. We've moved a number. I think the next thing will be to make any kind of tiny clinical difference, even with a drug that's difficult to take. But once we do that, we've got a foot in the door. And then what happens is you start being able to slow progression a little bit for lots of people. And if you can do that, what you're doing is, in the background, you make progress. And in the foreground, you're buying time. So if we can delay the progression of Huntington's disease by one year in everyone in this room, that's not actually a huge thing compared to the whole scale of the problem that we have. But in that year, imagine how much progress we can make. And the next drug we develop, we combine it with the first one, and that buys us another 18 months. Anyway, I'm painting, and uh, it's very easy to, it's very easy to cure Huntington's disease in the <laughs> fertile fields of the imagination. Um, but you know, uh, I think that's what will happen. Thank you all. We have uh, several variations on questions about Huntington and the Huntington protein. So, um, and we talked a little bit about this in the last session. But what does Huntington do, and why does it take so long for it to mess things up? Why do people get Huntingtons when they're adults, usually? So, yeah, that's uh, something that you could write a whole thesis on, I think. So, uh, How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> because you have. <laughs> I you have passed my PhD, <laughs> but uh, thanks, Ed. Um, yeah, so, hang on, can you, so, uh, why, wh what does the Huntington protein do? Okay, so the Huntington protein, according to all the literature that is published on Huntington's disease, is involved in nearly every cellular process you can possibly imagine or describe. Um, and that's almost certainly not the case. Um, and a lot of this is because of science, which was not necessarily the best. And some of uh, you know earlier disease models that people used weren't uh, the most accurate. And now we have um, an amazing plethora of different disease models that we can use, which we hope better simulate what is happening in patients. Um, but it's probably likely that Huntington is doing more than one thing at a time. And so the analogy I used earlier today is that Huntington is a bit like a Swiss Army knife where it's in the cell and it's doing lots and lots of different things all the time. It's involved in regulating our DNA. It's involved in regulating uh, which genes are switched on and which ones are switched off. It's involved in how our cells make energy. It's involved in how nerve cells like transmit messages in the brain, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, we're still a long way off pinpointing exactly the molecular mechanisms by which all of those things are happening. And uh, that's the, the research that you know, myself and lots of other people in the world are trying to pin down and do more of. But yeah, the question about like, well, what goes wrong and why does it take so long for th you know, symptoms to arise in patients is a very multifaceted, um, there's many ways you can ask this, but one thing that we know and that we talked about earlier today is the fact that um, depending on the CAG number, this will change the age of onset to when people will start to experience symptoms. So that's one factor that we know is that um, the, uh, you know, the CAG um, number that you have will change when we think that you will likely get symptoms. And then there are also other things that Ed mentioned earlier, these things called genetic modifiers. So these are other kind of changes in the signatures of our DNA that can cause someone to get symptoms earlier or later. You know, the exact reason why you um, don't, you can, you can be making the expanded, you know, harmful form of the protein for 40 years and you don't seem to have any symptoms is something that a lot of people are still really studying to understand exactly why that is happening. Is there some kind of accumulation that we don't understand or is it something about the aging process which is kind of tipping people over an edge at some point? Um, and yeah, that's a major focus of research. But I think, like, generically, our brains and our neurons are 
just sort of really good at withstanding challenges, right? There are some things they can't withstand, like, you know, and a neuro we're all, uh, if you're over the age of 25, you'll leave the room with fewer neurons than you entered it. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> um, but um, broadly speaking, though, like, I mean, in, it, when we were hunter-gatherers, you know, we would die at the age of 30. And, and you know, most people are, are living a lot longer than that now. And uh, uh, partly that's because of our human ingenuity. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that physically, our neurons can survive a really long time, even if difficult things are happening to them. Yeah, definitely. And um, what we know is that there are all these really cool studies of the brain and people doing these kind of single cell mapping technologies where we're working out, well, which cells are the ones that are dying and which ones are the ones that are most affected because actually not all the cells are affected. So making the, you know, the bad form of the protein is not always of great consequence and like in every single type of the cell. And it depends on your age and which cells you're in and everything else. Um, and so there's, but we can use that information as clues to try and find out, okay, well, how can we stop this bad process happening in the cells that are dying? Um, in the same way that we're looking at the mod genetic modifiers to work out, well, why is this person getting their symptoms so late? Can we apply that to, as a treatment or a, a cure for people who are getting the disease earlier? And just to complicate things even more, we talk about the unexpanded protein and the expanded protein, and we may give the impression that the unexpanded one is good and the expanded one is bad, but isn't it true that the expanded protein can do most of the stuff that the unexpanded one does? Yeah, so this has kind of been, well, this is my uh, scientific opinion, but there's kind of been this misnomer for a long time that making the expanded form of the Huntington is only a bad thing. But actually, in the lab, there's a lot of evidence that if you look at just the expanded Huntington protein and the unexpanded, they're actually almost indistinguishable. There's not actually very much difference between them. So, so what's happening with the expanded form is something very subtle, and that's what a lot of people are trying to work out and trying to figure out, like, what is it exactly that's going on? Um, so it's not as simple as if you're making the expanded bad pathogenic form of the protein that people think is toxic that you'll get sick. It's, there's, there's a lot of pr steps in that process. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll add something. Um, so I think it might be worth mentioning also uh, the way that humans evolved evolutionary, evolutionarily to include this expanded CAG repeat length. Um, I think it's interesting, right? So there's a researcher in Italy, her name's Elena Cataneo, and she has done sequencing on hundreds of different organisms all the way down uh, the phylogenetic tree. So things like very simple single-celled slime and things like that, um, all the way up to what humans. What did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> You're much higher up, Ed, don't worry. Um, and so she found that actually the Huntington gene is present quite early on evolutionarily, but it's only the CAG repeats that start to become present when creatures start developing a higher order nervous system. Um, and so the thought is that humans started developing more CAG repeats to increase the size of our brain and the complexity of our nervous system. And so I guess it's kind of like this interesting fact that maybe people who have Huntington's are at the forefront of evolution, at the tipping point of pushing humanity where their brains are capable of going. We've just reached kind of too far, um, and that's having detrimental effects. So I think that's um, not necessarily answering the question, but maybe interesting. No, but I think it, I think it really <laughs> is important for understanding the subtlety of the situation and why, I mean, HD is all or nothing in some sense, but every HD patient is different, every brain is different, and every cell in the brain is different, and every Huntington molecule is maybe different in some ways. Well, I'm gonna jump from single-celled slime to um, clinical trials and, and research participation in humans. <laughs> um, and uh, someone asks, uh, I'm not at risk, and I'm wondering which trials I can get involved in. I'm gonna expand that to say, how can folks within the HD community, whatever, um, whatever their role is, if they're not able to participate in a drug trial as someone who has the HD gene, how can they get involved and make a difference? So think about the Generation HD1 trial, 800 people. It was the, one of the biggest phase three trials we've ever run in Huntington's disease, but it was 800 people in the world, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, which is like, if everyone in this room was a participant, no, if everyone at this meeting was a participant at that in that trial, uh, that would, that would be more than half of the people that the whole trial encompassed. So, and most trials are much smaller than that. Like, the, the, if everyone in this room volunteered for the PTC and Novartis trials, 
that's it, the trials will be full. So the vast, and like clearly the people in this room are not the majority of people in the world with Huntington's disease. So the bottom line, I think, is that however many trials we run, the vast majority of people, for one reason or another, won't be part of those trials. And like, it's really important, and I know it's like it's a very boring doctory thing to say, but it's really important to remind ourselves that the purpose of the trials is to test drugs for the entire human race so that the world will be better for everyone. And that involves taking on some risk, and you know that's become very real in recent years, not just with the ASO thing, but with the idea of gene therapy, having brain surgery, right, to undergo a treatment that's irreversible. So, so you know, for that reason and for many others, uh, first of all, most people won't be able to be in clinical trials. Some people who are participating in clinical trials get placebo for the duration of the whole trial. So, um, and those are the realities, and trial participation is difficult. Nonetheless, it's brilliant that people want to be in clinical trials, but I think that the, if, if my advice is be, take part in any research that you reasonably can. Be enthusiastic about clin clinical trials, but be enthusiastic about everything else, because we never know where the insight will come from that gives us the drug, that gives us the trial, that gives us the first meaningful treatment for Huntington's disease. And a really good example is the Enroll HD study, right? It's Roby's at the back from CHDI. And I hope he won't mind if I say that the Enroll HD study is not a very sexy study, okay? <laughs> so it's not like, it's not glamorous. You don't take a drug. Uh, you don't go in an MRI scanner. You don't uh, get a robot that follows you around at home and like uh, does your bidding. It's questionnaires, okay? It's a blood draw. It's, um, a, a, you know, uh, taking a, a family history. It's writing down a list of medications, and you do it every year. The upside to that is it's pretty easy to take part in, and uh, because it's designed to be quite straightforward and simple, you can take part in it every year, and tens of thousands of people have done it. And that study has been the source of some of the most important breakthroughs in the past five years in Huntington's disease. N specifically, using the massive data set from that study, we now have a really good idea which genes are important in determining how quickly Huntington's develops in a person who has the mutation. Part of, it is, part of the answer lies in the HD gene, part of it lies in other genes, and many of those genes are, are involved in the machinery that, that repairs our DNA, and that's produced huge insights which are leading to new treatment approaches. And that's simply because sufficient numbers of people took part in Enroll HD. So my first answer to that question is, if you can, and nearly everyone can, please do sign up for Enroll HD. Please attend regularly. Roby wants to say, no, oh, uh, uh, but also um, other stuff, right? So. On the basis of Enroll HD, other studies uh, can um, uh, proceed much more efficiently. I I'm biased because I'm the chief investigator, but HD Clarity exists and is much easier across the world because it uses the Enroll HD platform. So once you've had your annual Enroll HD visit, we then have nearly all the information we need to um, enroll you into HD Clarity, stick a needle briefly into your back, collect spinal fluid, and that generates incredibly valuable data. But I think the overriding answer to the question is, uh, whatever research um, you are offered but at your local site, and whatever research you can participate in, if you reasonably can, you should think about doing it. Roby. That was going to be my next comment. Thank you. Right, Roby. I agree. Yeah, so I thought that in might the be what you were going to say. I'm also going to add uh, that there, if you go into the exhibitors uh, part of your app, there are a variety of surveys there that have that are being done by scientists and um, social workers and genetic counselors all over the country. That's sometimes for people who 
are gene negative, sometimes for caregivers. We also host these on HDSA's website. I think and it's, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. I think it's worth adding, um, Ed mentioned a lot of these studies are being used to find genes that are very current in HD research now, but these samples are also available to HD researchers to answer questions we haven't even asked yet. So these samples can be used in perpetuity to kind of fund future research at the scientific level. And so it's not just making discoveries now and answering questions that we have now, but they're going to be used in the future. So this isn't just something um, that's a snapshot in time. It's something that will help HD research in the future for a long time to come. That's an excellent point. And on a very similar note, um, the, the little studies that may be one or two sites uh, give rise to ideas that then give rise to bigger studies, right? So we're back, back in the midst of time, my first study was a pretty small study putting people in an MRI scanner and trying to discover the best way to measure how much the brain was shrinking, whether they had HD or not. And, um, you know, that study was, uh, some people remember it, but not many. But it did help to establish the methods that then were enrolled, that were folded into Track HD, And those methods are now the foundation of the methods that we use to measure brain volume changes in the clinical trials for HD. And so I've always said science is cumulative. And you never know what will become of the seeds that you plant. The only thing we know is what happens if we don't plant enough seeds. I'm going to ask a question about ethics here. Um, I, I've also been posed some questions related to this by members of the NYA. Um, so this is kind of a, more of a broad focus on lots of topics and ethics, but I'm going to narrow this a bit to drugs. So um, why can't we study or use things like ketamine, psilocybin, cannabis um, in in research, are, are folks doing that? Why, um, why are, isn't it being prescribed more for HD? So just kind of broadly, can you talk about drugs? Anyone? You're the real doctor. Go <laughs> for it. <laughs> Actually, the real doctor is the PhD. The, the medical doctors have an honorary status it's of doctor. True. I mean, of course I have both, but uh, <laughs> uh, we didn't dwell on that. I'm stalling for time, so I don't have to talk about magic mushrooms. So here's the answer. Um, I think... If those molecules were discovered now, they absolutely would be, uh, uh, you know, prime candidates for potential um, investigation in brain diseases, including Huntington's disease. But they weren't. They were discovered many years ago in contexts where uh, they were discovered and used by people for recreational purposes. And those purposes were interpreted by the society of, of the time to be harmful or undesirable. And so very strict laws were passed about the use of those substances by people, and that includes very uh, tight restrictions on the use of those substances in research. So it's, the answer is essentially it's a, it's a historical quirk. Um, and the, they are studied, right? So um, there's been quite a bit of study of cannabis compounds in Huntington's disease. No clear signal has emerged that they are beneficial overall. Um, although there certainly are plenty of anecdotal reports of people's symptoms being relieved by the use of cannabis and other and cannabis-derived compounds. There is, now that's the one side. So, you know, yes, we probably should study these things more because 99% of, or maybe 99.9% .9 of drugs, if you take them by mouth, they just wouldn't get into the brain. And the thing about these psychotropic drugs is they've passed that hurdle by definition. They, you know, they're popular recreationally because they do get into the brain. However, because of the lack of research, on the one hand, it's tempting to say great potential is being withheld from us uh, because it's more difficult to study these drugs because of the regulations. On the other hand, because of the lack of evidence, it's all, that also kind of creates a vacuum into which people who have a strong view about one thing or another can say, I bet you this mushroom or this hallucinogenic or licking this toad is going to be... Uh, <laughs> is gonna be beneficial for Huntington's disease, but they won't uh, let us study it. So let's, you know, uh, that's, you know, and that's, that's as much as I can say, but I bet you it's therapeutic. Actually, that isn't how science works. You can have a hypothesis, um, but until the hypothesis is tested, uh, you won't know. And there isn't really anything fun, the, the thing about these drugs is that the experiences they create are kind of enjoyable to the person doing it because the drugs are sort of what we would call, as pharma pharmacologists would call, kind of messy, okay? So the, an acid trip or an experience of, of uh, t taking cannabis 
is a kind of, it creates a very diverse uh, um, and, and somewhat unpredictable uh, array of experiences that could be very different from one person to another. And actually that isn't really a great starting point for a drug that is gonna be like a symptom control drug or a disease modifying drug for a disease. Because actually if you gave like um, a hallucinogenic drug to someone who um, uh, you know, is just wanting to kind of go about their daily life and, and you know, complete a spreadsheet or whatever, the, the cognitive effects of that drug would probably end up, or in many cases could end up being um, l less uh, more harmful than helpful for those things. I guess the point is, you know, even if you look at the things that the drugs, the reasons the drugs are taken, they vary wildly from one person to another. Um, and overall, yeah, so the answer sometimes then is, well, well you, you need to microdose, you need to microdose. And there's, it's often said with a degree of certainty uh, that, um, that with, there's no basis for it um, because the studies haven't been done. So should, should there be more study of these things? Yes. It, should that be a top priority? Not necessarily, right? Because actually, we're studying molecules that were designed from you know one atom at a time to target the known pathology in Huntington's disease. And a substance that may be psychoactive and may have some desirable effects in some other conditions isn't necessarily above, the, above that design for HD molecule in the, in the pecking order. We should absolutely study everything that has a reasonable chance of success. But the fact that something is a kind of a hallucinogenic or a psychedelic doesn't necessarily mean that, <coughs> that, that there's a, a, some great sort of truth that's being hidden or that, that it should automatically be top priority. Is that fair? Do you want to speak up in defense of magic mushrooms? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, they used to grow wild where I grew up, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't advocate for them. I, what I wanted to say is that there are actually, although it's not prevalent, there are actually labs who have access to, like, um, to these drugs and that they can use them in very controlled circumstances. And that research is not, it's still happening, but it's happening in this very controlled environment and it's everything is very measured. Um, the other thing I would say is that it's important to remember that uh, large science institutes like the uh, NIH in the States, but also all these really big pharmaceutical companies have absolutely ginormous compound libraries that they're using in a lot of their screening to find new drugs that have molecules that aren't maybe the exact molecule of cocaine, but that look very like it. And they're, these things are called analogs, and they're called you know this to be similar chemotypes. And that's the kind of sciencey language to say, these are molecules that look like drugs that exist, but they're not quite that thing. And maybe they probably work in a very similar way if we use them. And to date, no one's actually shown that any of these things are good drugs for treating specific diseases just yet. But it, so it's just all to say, that this research is still happening nonetheless, that it's not, there's no conspiracy to hide, you know, the potential benefits of any of these things, I don't think. Because if, if they did work, that would be amazing and it would be a, a great thing and that's what everyone wants. We've got some questions here about, I'm, I'm going to ask that folks um, uh, submit their questions in the app. Um, and we've got, okay, we've got lots and lots of questions trying to address as many as possible. I'm going to, um, ask a few about uh, inheritance now. Um, and I'm happy to kind of repeat these separately, but they're all kind of interrelated. So uh, someone asked if a parent with 36 repeats who perhaps um, doesn't develop Huntington's disease in their lifetime, um, whether they can pass on an expanded HD gene. Um, there's also a question about whether there's a higher chance of getting HD from your dad than your mom. Um, uh, and maybe the idea of getting JHD um, more from your dad than your mom. Um, and then a, an example, are there examples of people with two expanded Huntington genes? And is there anything interesting about that? So I can repeat those, but I think they're all sort of in the same realm. Everyone's looking at me, so I'll start. Um, yeah, so there's a, a phenomenon in genetics called genetic anticipation. And that tends to occur more when Huntington's is passed down <coughs> paternally rather than maternally. Um, so it does tend to be the case, if you inherit Huntington's from your father, uh, those tend to be the cases where there's a, a higher increase in CAG repeats. Um, and then the first question was if you have 36 repeats. So in the case where you have genetic anticipation or you have um, Huntington's passed down from your father, if your father had 36 repeats and you had genetic anticipation, meaning you're really bumped up higher in the CAG repeats, that could put you over 40 and it could put you in the range. 
And so Huntington's is a disease that geneticists would call 100% penetrant. Like if you have the gene, you're going to develop symptoms, but there's actually this gray zone, right? If you have between 36 and 39 CAGs, you're in that gray zone where you could develop Huntington's or you could not, um, kind of depending upon environmental factors and genetic modifiers that you have expressed in your body. Uh, but your the next generation, if there is genetic anticipation, if you do see that bump up in CAGs, their chances of inheriting Huntington's is much more likely. Anything to add? Uh, it's basically what you said before about the slime mold, right? So the gene, on average, uh, wants to grow, right? The CAG wants to grow. It doesn't have a brain, but over evolutionary time. It is a gene where the number of CAGs has tended to grow. And that is something that tends to happen every time anyone, whether they have HD or not, whenever anyone passes down a Huntington gene, it will tend to grow. Now, in people who have two non-expanded copies of the gene, that process is incredibly slow, right? So if you've got 17 and 18, there's very, very, very high chance that your kids would inherit a 17 or an 18 from you, and that's obviously still in the, in the normal range. But, and sometimes it grows by one, and sometimes it shrinks by one. And actually, the number in your blood is not necessarily the number in every cell in your brain, but we maybe don't have time to go into that. But it's a, so it's all a bit of an inexact science, but oh, overall, these things tend to expand. Expansions are more likely under two circumstances. No, one is when a dad passes down a gene, the other is when the gene is big to start with. So um, if, uh, if someone has a, a big CAG and they are a man, that's when we are more likely to see a big upwards leap in the number of CAGs in the next generation. And that's why most cases of juvenile onset Huntington's disease come from dads, but not all. And occasionally, we see a, a repeat go from a range that wouldn't be expected to cause disease in that dad uh, with a massive jump in the next generation, and those are rare, but when they happen, what you get is a case of juvenile onset Huntington's disease from a dad who doesn't seem to have HD at all. Um, the other thing to say is, like I said, though, these rules apply in general, but they, they do not necessarily, um, th well, they, they apply in every case and in general, but the outcome is not predictable in any individual case. The only thing we can be sure of is that inheriting an expanded uh, gene or not is always exactly 50-50, right? It's the toss of a coin. And that's true whether it's a mom passing down the gene or whether it's a dad passing down the gene. What changes is the number of CAG repeats. And it can shrink as well as grow, right? We see contractions from one generation to the next as well as expansions. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's all a bit of an inexact science. Um, but I hope those are some kind of generally useful guidelines. Oh, and the other question was about people with two copies. OK. So there definitely are people um, who have two expanded copies of the Huntington gene. And that usually comes from um, situations where both parents have a, well, a bit by def more or less by definition, both parents have an expanded copy. And then there's a one in four chance uh, it's like you get you toss a coin twice, you get two tails. That means that the kid will um, the kid will inherit two expanded copies of the gene. Uh, it's rare. It's been most commonly seen in situations where there's lots of HD families in close proximity. Most notably in the um, Latin American communities, like in Venezuela, where as we you may know, there are lots and lots of like HD is thousands of times more common than it is elsewhere in the world. Uh, one of the th strange things about that situation is that um, the people who inherit two expanded copies of the gene don't overall clinically do worse than people who only inherit one copy. And that was a real surprise when it was first realized. It's actually uh, the only thing really that determines their age of onset is the size of the bigger CAG repeat. But it kind of touches on what Rachel was saying about how the mutant, the uh, expanded Huntington protein isn't all bad. And actually, even if you have two mutant co expanded copies <laughs> of, that, uh, of that gene and of that protein, it's, it's trying its hardest, right? That protein is doing most, if not all, of the good stuff that the non-expanded protein is doing. It just has a slightly dark, uh, uh, e I wouldn't say evil, a mischievous uh, streak to it <laughs> that is um, pesky. pesky. <laughs> That's the right <laughs> word. Um, yeah, good. 
Okay, this is um, this is a, a good one and a, and a tough one. Um, but the question is, who funds HD research and what incentivizes them to keep funding it? Is there anything big picture that would encourage more funding, uh, either something that we could do, something that the government could do, or industry could do, et cetera? I'm going to start with this one by saying that you know there are nonprofits like HDSA, um, like the Hereditary Disease Foundation, uh, like CHDI, which is a foundation that solely supports HD research, and we're very fortunate that within this rare disease community, we have uh, a resource and uh, a group of folks like CHDI that is um, working solely on research in a, a very large picture way, uh, running things like the Enroll HD platform study and all of its offshoots, um, as well as lots of different types of HD research all the way up and down the pipeline. Um, so I'll start there, with, um, but in terms of you know, what we can, can do about it, um, that's also something that, that these types of nonprofits are working on. So you know, HDSA does a lot of advocacy work on that side with, um, with the FDA, with the government. Um, uh, but in terms of funding, I'm, I'm going to sort of hand it, hand it over here and see if you've got any I mean, ideas. In a sense, the answer is the same. The answer is HD is funded in the same way as every other disease. So it's partly by charitable giving. Um, and that is, you know, bake sales and um, marathons and walks for hope and all of that stuff. And, and, and that adds up to a huge amount in the, in the overall picture. Uh, but it's also like strategically really important because that money uh, often goes to organizations like HDSA, which because they know HD families so well, are able to distribute that money in sensible ways and the most useful ways. Then the next thing would be like government money, right? So the government agencies or the big uh, science funding agencies in the US, it's NIH, Canadian Institutes for Health in Canada. In the UK, we have the Wellcome Trust and the Medical Research Council, among others. And uh, those, generally speaking, kind of give money to research on the basis of um, how common the disease is, right? So. The, it, something like lung cancer would get way more money than Huntington's disease. And it's difficult to argue, if you zoom out and look at the whole earth, difficult to argue that that's not fair. So, but actually, HD, even at the level of public funding for um, health research, HD punches above its weight, and that's because of the stuff that we talked about at the very beginning of our thing this morning, which is um, HD has this genetic certainty Right, it's a it's a re reasonably common but not super common brain disease, neurodegenerative disease, um, and uh, but it's 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 unusual like by, by comparison to things like motor neuron disease in that every single case of HD has the same basic genetic cause, and for that reason HD is recognised as a disease in which uh, we have a s much more solid understanding of the problems we need to solve, and. Therefore, we are seen as having made more progress than many other brain diseases. HD was the first disease really in which we gave an ASO drug into the spine and we meaningfully altered the level of the disease-causing protein. That hasn't really, un well, at the time, that certainly hadn't been done in any other brain disease. And, and that's the kind of stuff that funding agencies look at and they think, oh, these HD uh, people seem to be onto something. They're, they, they're using what we know about the disease and they're making really solid progress. It doesn't always go the way we want, but like they're, they, the, the nature of the disease attracts more funding than you would expect on the basis of how common it is. We are also fortunate to have um, some major funding organizations that other diseases don't have. And uh, it, it, you know, CHDI Foundation has been an incredible driver of HD research back from when um, it was uh, you know, something that would fund academic labs and a similar model to like the NIH and as it's grown over the years CHDI Foundation is a combined kind of funder and organizer and um, uh, I don't want to say executor but it, ex it carries out research <laughs> um, and that's a huge resource and as Leora says it's really doing this kind of foundational stuff um, that is uh, again not like sexy sexy, but my goodness me, it's some of the stuff that's made the biggest difference to, and having these kind of infrastructures, big research databases, big rolling longitudinal um, studies, contacts with the pharmaceutical industry, bringing in dozens of pharmaceutical partners that otherwise would not have 
touched HD or certainly wouldn't have been involved in HD to the extent that they are. Why does anyone give money for HD research? I think the answer is the same as uh, why, does, why, why is this person in love with me? There's no need to ask. <laughs> All you need to know is that they are. <laughs> I don't really know how to follow on from that. <laughs> The only thing I was going to say to kind of add on to what Ed had already mentioned is that, you know, we consider HD to be this monogenic disease. That means there's one mutation that we really think is the, you know, the driver of Huntington. So this change to the Huntington gene is what drives Huntington's disease in every patient. And so Huntington's disease research is not just being funded in HD labs, it's being funded in people who work in genetic therapies. Because if you are developing your brand new genetic therapy and you're like, okay, well, how am I going to use this and what situation am I going to apply it in? There's, you know, obviously a clear unmet therapeutic need in the HD fields. And it's this, you know, in a lot of uh, geneticists' mind, this very nice disease where you know exactly what is going wrong at a genetic level. So they can use their new tools and their new technologies to come in and try and see if they can fix what's going on. Um, and so it's not just Huntington's that's being funded, it's like these genetic technologies as well. And the other thing that's also going on as well is that Huntington's is this, you know, a very clear cut example of this one mutation leading to neurodegeneration. And so lots of people who are studying dementia more generally or other neurodegenerative diseases like to look at HD populations where it's very clear cut which group everyone is in. You either have the HD gene or you don't. And so it's very much more, it's a simple system to, for a lot of scientists to look at. Thanks all. Um, this question is about a specific study, the Roche study which, uh, the, of Tom and Erson, which the Gen, Gen HD1 study, which um, I think is still on a lot of folks' minds. Um, and Tom and Erson will be, c is being continued to be developed in, in clinical trials. So the question is really, um, is, could this failure have been due to a sort of overdose? of the drug? I mean, I, I sort of, yes, and but also no, I think. <laughs> so an overdose, I think, has a very like specific meaning where like you, you give too much drug to one person and you see, you see visible harm emerging in that person and you know that that person has had too much drug. Um, what I think happened was that overall the there were good reasons for choosing the dose of drug, 120 milligrams, and there were good reasons for choosing the, the interval of dosing. Um, but what I think wasn't accounted for sufficiently was the, uh, I guess, the um, fragility of the HD brain, right? And how, um, how, how it may, it, it's probably easier to, to make neurons unhappy or even to cause damage to neurons in an HD brain uh, than it is in a brain that doesn't have HD. So I think, um, I guess it's a kind of overexposure, I would say, rather than an overdose. So, but I don't know. I mean, I, fundamentally, we don't know whether a lower dose would have been good. Um, that's one of the things that we're hoping to find out in the next study, which is gonna be testing lower doses and in people with who are much earlier in the disease course. Um, the, yeah, I think that's the answer. Like, it, you can think of it as an overdose, but actually, if it was an overdose, then like, in, you would have, what you would have seen is individual patients early on in the trial doing dramatically worse or developing um, obvious kind of new neurological changes that would that would make it clear that this was a study that needed to be halted much earlier on. I think what this probably was was a was a kind of chronic um, a chronic exposure to the drug that. That could have been could have been beneficial, but ended up not being beneficial because the brains were more fragile. Thank but we, I think, fundamentally, though, that's that's my hypothesis. But we just don't know, that, and that's why we had to test lower doses. Yes, and I think more is becoming clear as more data comes out as well. Uh, this is a question about uh, CAGs and involves somatic instability. Uh, why don't we test for CAG repeat length? Uh, multiple times, so uh, yearly, for example. 
Everyone's looking at me. All right. Um, so we test for CAG repeats in people's blood. Um, and blood cells tend to be a really stable cell type. But there are other cell types in the body that are very unstable. There are certain tissues that have um, just this capacity to really increase the number of CAG. So if we tested your blood when you were 15 years old, or let's make it 18, 18 years old, and you had 42 CAG repeats, when we tested it when you were 50 years old, it would likely still be 42. Um, but if we tested your brain sample, specifically in your striatum, where this tends to occur very heavily, um, it could be in the 50s when you're very young, and it could increase all the way up into the thousands. And so one of those reasons is because there are genes called DNA damage response genes, or DDR. Um, and you can think of these like little tools. They can go in and they can fix things, right? Like if you have a stutter in your genome, they would go in and say, hey, don't stutter anymore. Um, and there are certain modifications that people have. These are genetic modifiers. And if you have really great tools, they're going to go in and tell your other genes to stop stuttering. And you would have a really low CAG repeat in your brain. Um, but if you have poor, CAG, uh, poor DNA damage response genes, they might allow a really high stutter. And so what people are finding is that it's these tools, these DNA damage response genes that are acting as genetic modifiers. And these are really contributing to the age of onset in which people get Huntington's, even though they might have the exact same CAG repeat in their blood. So, follow-up question. If you know this stuff, but testing the blood repeatedly isn't going to tell you about this tendency, individual tendency for the CAG to grow. But if we know about these other genes, why don't we test for those other genes when we do the HD genetic test? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I think it's that we don't specifically know what we're looking for, right? Like we don't know what the modifications on those genes are. We know specifically what the genes themselves are, like there's a gene called MSH3, um, but we don't know how a modification in MSH3 might necessarily uh, make things better or make things worse. Uh, so. We could test for it. It's something that, of course, we could sequence. Like, sequencing isn't a really big deal anymore. We just don't have the knowledge of what to do with that information. It mm. wouldn't be helpful. Bingo. And I think that's right. I, w I, w I won't correct you because you're not wrong. But I will just add, <laughs> and then it's you. <laughs> I will just add, like, these discoveries about these DNA damage repair genes, these other genes that might influence onset and progression, those are really new discoveries. Like... Uh, they, we just had them last time we all met in person in, in 2019, but it's new, and it's only really been described in this one big data set. Um, really, that's not the level of, it's not yet the level of evidence that, that's needed to turn a new genetic finding into something that can be meaningfully conveyed to patients, to people. Even the CAG repeat, because the CAG repeat is not a great predictor, we generally tell people the CAG repeat, but the next thing we always say is, but actually this is probably not very useful information for you. If we can get more information about these other genes, we could potentially start to say, well, you've got this, this, this number of CAGs, and you've got this, which is a bad variant, but you've also got this, which is a protective variant. So overall, you may do a little bit better than someone else who had two bad variants. But again, it's the, an the, end, the final sentence is always going to be, your mileage may vary. And I think the, to answer the question about like why we don't test repeatedly is because, well, we can only test in samples that you can realistically take from patients. So like, we're not going to give someone open brain surgery to work out what CAG number their striatum is at when they're 20 years into the disease, right? It's like, you know, it, it has to be something that a tissue that we can access, so like a biofluid, whether, you know, and blood is an obvious one to take, um, but also things like CSF. And this is research that's being done by people to track to see you know, the changes in blood are small, but can we actually measure them similarly in other tissues as well? The other thing is that we know that these changes are happening to a really large extent in certain cells like the striatum in the brain, but there are a ton of other tissues in our body and people are now trying to work out, okay, well, what if I look at the liver or the kidney or like any other part of the body is... <laughs> Not yeah, a body part. All, all, so, yeah, not a body part, but... Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Honestly, I have to say this because Jeff isn't here, but Je in Jeff's mice, he's discovered that um, because the, the lining of the intestine is constantly being replaced, yeah. um, it's, it's one of these tissues which can show really big uh, increases in CAG repeat length. And he found this in his, in his HD mice. He collected their poo and unexpectedly found that the poo contained enough cells from the intestine that have big CAG repeats that the poo could be the future of Huntington's disease. <laughs> 
So there you are. You may all have to be giving stool samples in the future. <laughs> but yeah. So this is what scientists are trying to work out. And this kind of this basic research that we have with Jeff collecting poo from all his animals that is going to hopefully inform like what kind of samples are taken later. So the next convention in uh, New Orleans, the, uh, the hotel sewage system will be directly connected to CHDI headquarters <laughs> for the study of somatic instability. <laughs> I feel like any question that I ask after that is going to have like less weight. So I, I've got to, I'm going to, now I'm going to um, share two comments, which is, um, are you doing stand up comedy later? No, that was. I'm doing it now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was that was one. Of the, I'll find the other one in a bit. But I do um, want to ask a, a serious question, which is that um, someone says almost all trials are done on Caucasian cohorts, but HD is a human disease. So uh, what can you propose, or what are companies doing to change this situation? Uh, I'll start by saying um, I, I don't know if. Addis Mendezabal is in the audience right now, but she's a, a Berman Topper HDSA Career Development Fellow, and she is researching uh, the prevalence of HD in minoritized populations. And uh, really, I think that's one of the first steps: is better understanding uh, the prevalence of HD in in everyone, and not just white people. And it's really, um, you know, we have had ideas about the the percentage of people of different races that get HD, but I think that we're learning a lot more of that. Uh, about that, um, but I don't know if you know a little bit more from from the industry side about that because I know that you know there are definitely government agencies that are are pushing companies to to do their best to um, include more people of color in trials, um, and you know that's that's something that that HDSA is definitely focused on from a research and advocacy perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um it's, it's a completely valid point, and the answer is that we, we need more ethnic and other di forms of diversity to be f fully reflected in all of our research, observational and trials. Um, I think a big barrier, though, is, the, is the, across the world, but in, more, in some places more than others, is that there is a link between race and access to healthcare, and access to really good quality healthcare, and access to Huntington's disease specialist care. And so um, Carl Sagan, the cosmo cosmologist, said, to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And I think the answer to this question is for there to be um, racial, uh, true uh, equity in health research, first you have to reinvent the healthcare system. I'm not saying that that's the only thing we can do, because like that's, that's a white guy saying, oh, it's a really big problem, and uh, well, we can't do that, right? But I'm saying that the scale, the, this, the, we should do everything we can. We should pull on every lever that we can, um, but we can't ignore the big levers, and we really need to pull hard on the big levers, and that, that I think, is one. And, that, and that's across, across, the, across the globe, but it's much, more, it's much more of a problem in places, I think, where people have to pay out of their own pocket for their own health care. Is that fair? I mean, one thing I would add is that this is not just an issue of healthcare and clinical trials. This is a fundamental problem also just in basic science. So unfortunately, basic science has been driven by white middle-aged men for a very long time. And so, for example, like when the first human reference genome was published in 2001, we then realized that this white guy was a bit of a weirdo and actually had these strange things going on in his DNA which aren't actually representative of like the population as a whole. And so there's all kinds of efforts now to be like, you know, we need to get reference genomes from diverse populations so that we understand, you know, these subtle changes that are happening. And when we're doing these genome-wide association studies that we're talking about earlier to find these other modifiers, we know, like, what the consequences of these might be. And is this representative of this population or is it representative of something interesting or disease-related, for example? And so there are tons of efforts around the world now um, led by people like the Gates Foundation and also, but also the NIH and other big funders to try and bring that diversity into the reference data sets that, p that scientists are looking at. So, you know, this is not just something at the clinical level, it's something that needs to be addressed and people are trying to address like the whole way through the scientific process. And it's not just that we need to, oh, we need to study ethnically diverse populations because so then the numbers will match and the government will be happy. There, there are certainly discoveries that can only be made if we include 
enough people from enough parts of the world and enough genetic backgrounds, right? And a really good example is there's a guy called Darren uh, Moncton, who's a genetics researcher in Scotland, and he studies the genes which influence the rate of expansion of CAGs. And one of the things he's been doing lately is looking at black populations in South Africa. And what he's discovered, in uh, there aren't many people with HD in South Africa, um, but what he's discovered in a relatively small sample set is that they... they they ha are dramatically overrepresented uh, among genomes that have unusual um, sequences within the Huntington gene. So CAG, CAG, and then there might be CAA uh, interruptions in different places. The point is that these are insights, and, and, and now we get to think, well, what, what happens to those people, those people with these unusual combinations of CAAs and CAGs that we haven't seen in white people, do, uh, do they do better or do they do worse? Could we borrow that and give it to white people, give it to everyone, and use that as a means of understanding Huntington's disease and coming up with a treatment that might work for everyone? So that's another really good reason. It's not just about, oh, equality. It's, um, it's that, like, just to... to to, to have the biggest possible chance of making scientific breakthroughs, we need to access every human resource in the world that could possibly help us. Thank you. So the question is, could we, could we not use affirmative action like policies to, to try and increase uh, recruitment into trials uh, as well as all of the other stuff? I mean, I think the answer is potentially yes. Um, the, the issue is that because of the challenges that uh, minoritized people have in accessing healthcare in the first place, that could actually end up with slowing recruitment um, if, if there are, uh, but I, you know, certainly it's definitely something that could be done. We should do both. <laughs> we should turn the whole system upside down and we should do short-term things that might increase uh, recruitment diversity, for sure. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I know that these are very uncomfortable chairs, so <laughs> if you all want to like, stand up. I don't mind the up, chair. That's you, can, okay. you totally can. <laughs> um, but you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soldier on because you've really got a rapt audience for these 90 minutes. Um, so thanks all. Um, so the next question is, uh, how is it possible, oh, and it's jumping because there are so many questions, how is it possible um, to just target the mutant protein without affecting the healthy protein? So you spoke about uh, trials like what WAVE is doing. Um, how, um, and uh, yeah, that's the question. How is it possible to just target the mutant protein if there are two copies? So, um, so there are two copies, right? Everyone gets a copy of a gene from the mom and their dad. And even though the gene is the same, it's not an identical sequence. There are things in the gene called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, meaning there are single letter changes that can be taken advantage of. So when you have a message, it's nucleotides, and three of the nucleotides get translated into one amino acid for a protein. But this is a repetitive system. Each of those three nucleotides doesn't always equal the same amino acid. So Ed mentioned CAG, CAA. Those both code for glutamine. And we know Huntington's is a glutamine disease. And so if you have a small change in one of the sequences, specifically the sequence that's associated with your expanded CAG, you can design therapeutics that specifically target that. So the major advantage of doing this is that you're targeting only the expanded copy. But the major limitation of this is that you have to have a high enough percentage of the HD population that contains that single change. And so this is what limits that type of technology to people that include that sequence. So um, if you were part of the WAVE trial, you probably remember you had to get your blood drawn and you had to be selected based on the presence of that, that single nucleotide polymorphism specifically on your expanded copy. Um, and the disadvantage is uh, that it's not going to be 100% of people with HD. I think it was the two alleles or the two sequences that they selected covered something like 70% of people with HD. Um, uh, but the caveat being, if this approach works, obviously they would develop sequences that target s SNPs that the entire population has. So it's a little bit like, it, you know you can get an Apple AirTag. <laughs> an Apple AirTag, you know? I got one in my pocket. 
It's a, uh, oh, I haven't got it, I've, I've lost it. So basically, it's like, I don't know where my suitcase is, but it's got an air tag on it, and I can find it on the basis that it has an air tag, okay. And I haven't, uh, if I know where my air tag is, I haven't found my suitcase, but I can use that information to target the suitcase and find it, and potentially destroy it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, <laughs> but here's a follow-up question for you guys. If Huntington's disease is caused by the CAG repeat. Why don't we just target the CAG repeat? Why are we going for these uh, other little tags that are further down the gene? The issue is that CAG, uh, like I mentioned, codes for one of the amino acids. And it's actually a very common sequence within the body to have CAG, CAG. And so if we were to just solely target CAGs within the body, we would have what's called off-target effects. It would target more than the ju just the Huntington gene. Um, and I'm sure there are statistics that show how many genes and what percent of the genome has CAGs. I am not privy to that. I don't know that information. Um, but it would, it would be disastrous, basically. It might be, but it also it might not be. <laughs> so there is a company called Vico Therapeutics that's developing an ASO which targets the uh, the CAG. So it's an R it's a, an ASO that targets the RNA equivalent of a CAG. Um, and the idea is that um, Huntington's uh, has one of the larger CAG repeats in the genome. Um, there aren't there aren't many that are much bigger, but there are some. Um, and so the idea is, well, the, there may be an advantage to lowering Huntington, even if you also lower the concentration of some other CAG-containing gene protein, right, the product of those other genes. And what's more, the more CAGs you have as an HD expansion carrier, the more times the ASO will bind, and therefore you get something like an allele selective knockdown. Um, and the, the question is, like, really all we need right now is something that is less bad than Huntington's disease, right? <laughs> if we can make something less, if we can make people's lives less bad than they would otherwise have been if we do nothing, then that is progress. So anyway, that is the thing that is being developed. It uh, doesn't look like you'd be keen. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna add that, um, like, understanding these genetic signatures that happen within the Huntington gene is why it's so important that we have these massive genetic studies with both within HD populations and also within populations as a whole, like having this like wealth of information from not just European ancestry folks, but from people all over the world, it will mean that we can design, you know, wave, if their drug works, then they can be like, okay, well for this, you know, South African population or this Peruvian population, we need to change that signature so we can make a drug specific for that population. But until we have that data and we have access to all that information it's going to be tricky to do once we're in this sort of European bias. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, there's some, there are so many great questions, we haven't been able to get to all of them, but uh, maybe we'll do two more. Um, and this one is about uh, a protein called GM1, and um, the question is what happened with those clinical trial pushes. So a, a very small amount of backstory is that um, I believe it was in South Dakota or the D D Dakotas. Um, there uh, was a push for some uh, clinical trials that involved raising a, a certain type of sheep that had high levels of this protein called GM1 in their brains and then uh, extracting that and using it to treat HD. So d are you aware of any progress in that realm? I, I, that was one of the very first HD Buzz articles I ever wrote. Yeah, I remember <laughs> it well, and I remember the sheep thing, but uh, all I know is that there hasn't been any news on that program, to my knowledge, recently, which leads me to suspect that there must have, it must have come up against some kind of ro ro roadblock, speed bump, what's the, whatever the word is. And um, one of the things I think I remember being concerned about, uh, or discussing the potential concerns with that was that GM1 is a big molecule and it's a kind of a, it's a sort of, it's a combination of protein and lipid, so it's a kind of fatty, sticky molecule mm. and it wasn't at all clear how that, mo how adding that molecule to the, I think it was only done in animals so far, mm -hmm. but, and it seemed to produce a dramatic effect in those animals, but it wasn't clear what the basis of that effect was and whether it would be safe to do that in people, and if if you were going to do it in people, whether it made sense to take this sheep extract 
or to try and sort of synthesize either the GM1 thing in the lab or in a factory, or even to figure out how the GM1 thing was doing its thing and make something that is easier and cleaner uh, in a factory. Uh, those are sort of speculations as to why we might not have heard uh, in a while. Yeah, my understanding is that in um, there was a long period in HD research when we were kind of experimenting with uh, genetic changes in animals where you could uh, up the amount of protein or lower the amount of protein of lots and lots of different genes one at a time and show, oh, hey, this mouse with HD-like symptoms gets better or it gets worse. Um, and GM1 was sort of one of those. And there's this, um, there's a particular disease that um, also occurs in humans and human babies and also in sheep that causes a lot of this GM1 mm -hmm. to be produced. And it also goes down uh, in the HD brain. So the idea was to replace it. But um, a lot of those approaches, um, it, you know, it's, it's difficult to get any sort of one thing off the ground in terms of a clinical trial. Um, and also it was, a, it was a very sort of winding road towards that in terms of getting it out of sheep and right. uh, moving uh, towards The other thing I would say, I think, is that the, the, um, the results of the big genetic screens that led to the discovery of the DNA damage repair pathways, those really have dramatically changed our thinking about what the top priority approaches to Huntington's disease should be. Um, Jim Gazella is a very famous geneticist in the... Um, a, a university, uh, it's called Harvard, I think. I've, I, don't, I don't know, I haven't really heard of it myself. But anyway, so Jim says of these um, findings that come from big human genetic experiments, Mother Nature has already done the experiment, okay? So there are people in the world who, because they have these particular combinations of genes, have a much faster or a much slower than expected rate of progression of Huntington's disease. And um, that's a fact. The only thing that's missing is that we haven't yet turned that fact and those discoveries into a drug that does the same thing. Um, and so, like, it makes complete sense to focus our resources and our attention on, number one, Huntington, the known cause of Huntington's disease, and number two, stuff that comes up from these big 25,000-person um, genetic uh, cohorts because Mother Nature's already done that experiment. And so I think that's a... Pro and that's kind of a generic answer to why this approach or that approach hasn't yet been um, developed. We don't have infinite money. We don't have infinite patience. We don't have infinite resources. Some approaches are intrinsically dangerous. Some approaches are intrinsically difficult. Other approaches are intrinsically more promising because of where the information came from. I'm locked out of the Q&A, but I know that there was a question about why... Um, well, first, a simple one, which is, does HD ever skip a generation? No. And um, next, uh, I think this is going to be the last. Can uh, I just add to that? was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll add to it, but too. But to, I, I can't raise it. I can't raise it. Uh, the, the, point though, the point, though, is once, once someone who was at risk has a negative HD genetic test, their children are no longer at risk. And I think that's, that's, the, that's probably the, reassur the specific reassurance that that question may have been yes. asking for. I think confusion could also come, say, um, if one of your grandparents had it and you had a parent that died early right. uh, before they developed symptoms and then maybe the next generation had it. It could seem like it skips a generation, but conclusively, hands down, no, it does not skip a generation. Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Sorry, I'm getting uh, tired, everyone. <laughs> why is it... No. <laughs> <laughs> why is it that... Um, it's rare for people with HD to get cancer. Why do you think? I'm interested and I don't know. Do you think it's true though that they don't get cancer? There's not a lot of research out there. Right, so there have been reports um, uh, from Scandinavia, I think, that the incidence of cancer is much less frequent in people with Huntington's disease. But guess what, folks? People with Huntington's disease tend to die earlier than people who don't have Huntington's disease. and Cancer is a thing which becomes more common, broadly speaking, the longer you are alive. And so part of the issue, I think, is that people who have Huntington's disease uh, are li less likely to live long enough to get cancer. The other thing is when I think the reality of, pe of the medical care of people with Huntington's disease is that if, uh, if you have HD, you're, you're, you're less likely to be um, aggressively investigated 
for symptoms that might be something other than HD. So Huntington's can kind of mask symptoms that would otherwise end up being diagnosed as cancer. Um, and I think that's a kind of stigma that we really need to overcome because, you know, if there are if treatable forms of cancer that are being missed in HD patients, that's important. But it's also possible that there's direct biology going on. I mean, I would have to disagree with you about the age thing because nearly all of those studies did age match controls. So that isn't a factor. Yeah. But I would agree with you that when you're diagnosed with a one disease, it can be very difficult for doctors to kind of take their blinkers off and think about you having potentially multiple diseases at the same time. And that is like a problem that's inherent in modern medicine. Uh, but it is changing, I would say. I think what is interesting is that the fact that some of the top modifiers that came up in these big genetic studies are all things that are linked to DNA damage repair, suggests that maybe that's the link with cancer. And that's something that I think a lot of people are now pursuing in the lab, is they're trying to work out, well, what's happening with all these molecular machines that we have working busily away whilst we have no knowledge of any of this happening to us. But in each of our cells of our bodies, we've got all these machines going around checking our DNA, making sure our DNA is good, making sure that we're expressing proteins correctly with the right sequences, and that from one cell to the next, when we have replication of our cells, that our DNA is being absolutely correctly copied each time. And so we know that there's something going funny with this DNA damage repair pathways, and there's this link to HD. So it's very tempting to speculate that maybe that's the link with cancer. And there are people definitely pursuing that, but I would say the hard evidence is still not available. All right, everyone, let's thank our speakers. And thank you all so much for being engaged with research, for asking all these great questions. Um, Please participate in the blood draw study. HCSA staff is doing it, and we are busy at a convention, I promise you. It takes less than 10 minutes. Uh, thanks so much.